Chances are you know someone with schizophrenia. Its debilitating symptoms, which include hallucinations, paranoia, and social withdrawal, strike one in every 100 people. Dr. Nancy Andreessen and a team of scientists at the University of Iowa are using powerful new tools to help them peer inside the workings of the brain and gain a better understanding of this complicated disorder. The magical thing about photography is every time the lens opens, a little bit of history is recorded. Today's historian is John Van Allen, nephew of the physicist James Van Allen, discoverer of the radiation belts that also bear his name. John's subject, Dr. Nancy Andreessen, the University of Iowa psychiatrist who won the 2000 National Medal of Science, the same award James Van Allen won for his research into outer space. Andreessen's work, though, focuses on inner space, the workings of the human brain. We do have now tools that permit us to get inside the brain and measure its structure and its function. What we know now, compared with what we knew 10 years ago, is astonishing. We have now the means to begin to unlock the secrets of the mind and brain. Andreessen was awarded the National Medal of Science for her groundbreaking work with schizophrenia, a mental illness that causes delusions, hallucinations, and social withdrawal in 1% of the population. Her use of cutting-edge imaging techniques has led to a new understanding of the disease. It's important to understand what's going on in the brain behind the clinical symptoms. People who have this illness had an intact mind at one point, and then it's as if it's a panel of glass and somebody just took a hammer and the pieces have begun to fall apart. By comparing the neural activity in the brains of schizophrenia patients with that of non-sufferers, Andreessen and her associates interpret the differences. What they've learned is that schizophrenia is a disease characterized by miscommunication among several regions of the brain, a wiring problem that leads to the fragmentation of both the brain's functions and the patient's lives. We visualize changes in patterns of blood flow when the mind performs a particular kind of mental task. For example, right now I'm talking, and while I'm talking, I'm going to be using speech language areas here in my left hemisphere that are used for speech. I'll be using motor parts of my brain because I'm moving my lips. Uh, but I'm also using areas in the front of my brain called the frontal cortex because I'm planning what I'm going to say as I'm producing the speech, and I'm going back to, you know, word treasures in my temporal lobes and picking up words that have meaning in order to perform this very complex thing that we human beings do, which is talk to each other. So we can visualize in healthy, normal people the circuits that are used for a task, and then we can compare that with people who have schizophrenia. As quickly as you can. Ready? Go. Red, blue, blue. The brains of schizophrenia sufferers stumble at these seemingly routine functions. In some, this neural disconnect causes hallucinations, both visual and auditory. Other patients become paranoid, shrinking from a world they fear is out to get them. Many withdraw, both from themselves and from society. Much of the time, people with schizophrenia proceed from that onset on into a lonely existence where they have a sense that they've lost their self, they've lost their opportunity to go to school, to learn, to have a job, to have friends. It's a very tragic illness. One of the mysteries researchers are trying to unravel is why schizophrenia typically strikes in late adolescence and early adulthood, a time of dramatic changes for us all. We think that probably just the natural process of brain maturation that occurs during, say, the years of 15 to 25, plus the impact of gonadal hormones, testosterone and estrogen, probably plays a major role in causing the brains of some people to develop wrong and develop into a pattern that produces schizophrenia. The path Andreessen took to psychiatry was anything but traditional. Shortly after earning a PhD in Renaissance literature, she joined the faculty at the University of Iowa as an assistant professor of English. 
But the birth of her first child came with complications, a serious infection Andreasen looks back on as a life-changing event. The experience left her with a great admiration for the medical profession and questions about her career choice. I got my first book accepted for publication by Princeton University Press about six months after Susan was born. And I was still in my early 20s, which should have been a, a, a tremendous coup. And instead of being elated, you know, I just managed that book sitting on dusty shelves and never being read. And so basically I said, if I took the same amount of energy that went into writing that book and used it to tackle a problem in medicine, I might change a lot of lives in a way that I'm never gonna change a lot of lives writing books or even being an English professor, no matter how good I am. Within nine months of her daughter's birth, a new career germinated. The year was 1966, and the prospect of a woman attending medical school was not met with overwhelming acceptance. My parents really wanted me to marry a rich man and be a member of the Junior League. They were disappointed when I got a PhD, and they were kind of appalled when I said I thought I'd go to medical school. The medical school here wasn't real enthusiastic about admitting me either because they'd never had a married woman with a kid. In that era, it was an uphill struggle. I wonder if maybe you could begin by first telling me a little bit about what the problems were that you were having that brought you to the hospital. These days, Andreasen and her colleagues are in a struggle to unravel perhaps the most formidable and misunderstood of mental mm -hmm. illnesses. The rigors of their research, though, pale in comparison to the everyday struggles patients and their families endure. But Andreasen says the U of I research, coupled with new medicines and supported by the type of public awareness a National Medal of Science brings, are what make her optimistic. The great rewards are often some of the smallest things. You know, they're having people come up and hug me and cry and thank me. They're the Christmas cards I get in the mail from people all over everywhere. The, the fact that, you know, what I do gives people hope in what is sometimes a very hopeless situation.